So hey everybody, Josh Fleming from Atypical Life here with AC Spud and one Philip Seagal. Fantastic. Very nice. Very one nice. and only. Yes, very nice to have you here. Um, just before Thank we started you. recording, you were about to tell us a little fact about the TARDIS behind AC right there. Well, the, the, it's referred to as the Richard Houdolan TARDIS, which I, I suppose because it was sort of, um, he was the production designer, but curiously, uh, all, all, all his department did was build, uh, build it from the plans that I got from the BBC, uh, and they were for a, uh, for a Tom Baker TARDIS, um, and then sort of the, the paint department went crazy on the, on the exterior, which I really loved, I loved that, mm -hmm. that wonderful exterior. Um, and then we copied it for the main title sequence. There's a three foot TARDIS, which I, I still uh, have. Oh wow! Um, which was used for the uh, the main title sequence in those days. Uh, CG was was very expensive, so it was easier for us to actually uh, film with a with a real miniature. So, uh, as with all of these things, after it was finished, you know everything gets destroyed or thrown away or disappears. But I, I managed to hang on to the to, uh, to the to the miniature, which was built by a very talented young uh, Polish. Um, uh, he was a, um, I guess you call him a, he was a prop maker in, in Richard's department. And um, there is a photo of that actually that I took um, that's in my book, uh, Doctor Who Regeneration of him building that TARDIS. Uh, he did it from ha uh, by hand, everything, everything, including wow. the light on top, the handles, the lock on the door, every, everything on that a miniature is is all handmade. It was it was just extraordinary. That's a, that's a heck of a so trophy to have as well. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Very talented. I just saved it. <clears throat> yeah. I was going to say, do we know what's happened to the actual police box prop at all? Uh, as you say, a lot after movies, a lot of the time things get uh, mm -hmm. scrapped and stuff like that. Well, all the sets were held in uh, Van in Vancouver, British mm. Columbia, um, after the film was completed, obviously waiting decision on whether the show was going to get picked up or not. And, um, and then after it was, um, after we heard the news that we weren't getting picked up, uh, things just sort of was sold off by the studio and, and a lot of it disappeared. I do know the console itself is in the hands of a couple of uh, uh, guys that I think live in California. Oh. Um, and they restored it. So it does exist and it does end up on uh, in, in going to conventions and things like that for, for charity. Um, and, it, and it is, it is in fact the, the console. Um, wow. the, uh, the rest of the set was destroyed, unfortunately. The box itself disappeared. There were rumors that somebody had it in, in, in Canada, but I, I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, and the few things I did have from the sets, I sold an auction for charity at a Chicago convention in 97, I think, 97. 97. Um, and we raised money for um, various charities um, like MS and cystic fibrosis and things like that. Um, and I do know those, th those things are, are floating around, including the actual doctor's bag. Um, and um, so, so those things are out there, but um, yeah. I, 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 where they are, I don't know. A lot oh. of clocks and candles, I'd imagine. Yeah, <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> oh, yes. Um, so to begin, of this this interview off uh, firstly well welcome properly a, a very grand welcome here and uh, just just to the viewers watching and what have you could you tell us a little bit about yourself and some of the other projects you've done outside of Doctor Who? Sure well uh, I, I've been a producer for 37 years I suppose mm. um, uh, I started out in scripted programming and then I, I actually transitioned to reality tv and uh, 2004. And um, so I ended up uh, as the CEO of a, of a company called Original Productions, and we created shows like Deadliest Catch, Ice Road mm -hmm. Truckers and Storage Wars, amongst other things. Wow. So um, a Thousand Ways to Die. Uh, a thousand Ways to Die. Very good. Yeah, I, I directed several of those episodes, actually, in the first season. Mm. Um, but prior to that, you know, I, um, I, as you know, you know, I had a sort of a storied career as an executive uh, mm -hmm. um, and a producer. Um, so um, 
since then, um, I've slowed down a, a little bit, uh, but, um, you know, for, for personal reasons uh, that I don't really want to get into, but uh, right. suffice it to say, in the last couple of years, I've, I've, I've sort of slowed down. I am uh, developing a show for Discovery right now, and I'm writing the screenplay um, mm. uh, that was commissioned that I, I can't, unfortunately, I can't talk about, but uh, oh yeah, no, so no, that's no. what I'm currently doing. I, I'm I'm sort of doing a lot of lot of writing and um, and and some developing, but mostly I'm also uh, enjoying myself uh, in semi retirement. To be honest mm. with you, I have a YouTube channel called Spruverse. Oh, um, that's S P R U E V E R S E Spruverse. Spruverse. And that's on YouTube, and Fantastic. I uh, I build models. And oh, hey. uh, so I've, I've been really enjoying myself doing that. And I do a um, uh, shameless plug for it. There is a couple of uh, actually a uh, couple of episodes in which I, I build a Dalek one. Uh, wow. And I, I build a Dalek and I build Davros. And, and I talk a little bit about uh, the Doctor Who production there. And so, so that's really what I'm doing. And then just sort of enjoying myself, really. Great to hear. Um, what kind of Dalek? Yeah. Oh, what kind of Dalek is it? Uh, it was the MK3 from the Peter Cushing movie. Right. Oh, nice. um, it, it was the old... Uh, it, years ago, um, uh, when I would go back to England, you know, or go hmm. home, I should say, uh, for visits, I would always, always make a pilgrimage to, uh, to Comet Miniatures, which was in Battersea on Lavender yeah. Hill. It was a, one of the greatest hobby shops um prop shop uh you know collector shops in on the planet i mean it was i was just you could never get enough of it and so you know you could always find me in there oh yeah <laughs> and uh so uh and small they had a line of uh they had a line of um hobby kits very crude but i had had one for years and years and years of of the of the dalek and then there was another company called Savans uh, hmm. that also made some some crude things. But I built both versions. I built a, an MK3 and I also built Davros on the channel. That's amazing. Yeah, I'll be sure to leave a link in the description for that. So when, when this goes well, out, it's a design, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Yes. Shameless plug for my hobby. <laughs> yeah. Always good. Cool, um, man. Oh, yeah. Um, so next question is, Doctor Who is clearly a part of your life. Can I ask when you became a fan? Well, uh, my grandfather sat me on his knee. He was um, uh, he lived in, in Hendon, 133 mm. Audley Road for, ma for many years in Hendon. Wow. And I sat on his knee and we watched the pilot episode, An Earthly Child of Doctor Who. Wow. And I was hooked. The and 760 episode. episodes later, uh, mm. I was still watching it all the way up until um, obviously Sylvester McCoy's uh, season, and then mm. uh, they canceled the show. Mm. Uh, so my, you know, my passion for for Doctor Who was, was incredible. As a young kid, um, I, I I basically, you know, it, it was. It was everything in my in my in my role playing, my fantasy. Mm -hmm. uh, any chance I got to to role play in Doctor Who, I would. I, I obsessed about the the episodes, and yeah. and uh, I hid behind the couch just like everybody else did. My mother always reminds me of of uh, how petrified I was. Uh, most mostly of the Cybermen because yeah. in the earlier days when they would come out of the sewers, you know, and then um, or they'd be in the underground, and my father would take us to London. The last thing I wanted to do was go in the underground, you know, oh, because I mean, it, I never wanted to see a Cyberman. They were it was petrified. Yeah, but um, it just um, it, it it locked into my imagination uh, as a character, as a uh, as 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 a world, and it never left. Mm. Oh, that's fantastic. When you went through that, did you have a, a, a favourite Doctor? Did you have a favourite era? Or was it just a general love for the whole run, if you see what I'm saying there? Well, it's funny you should say that. You know, I was always getting asked that. And for me, as a producer, it was really difficult to, to, to say, you know, because you didn't want to upset or insult anybody. Yeah. But um, and, it, and it's always it's always difficult to try and, and, and be neutral about all of these things. But I would I would have to say uh, for me personally that I thought uh, Tom Baker mm. uh, brought the most to the role, in my opinion. 
Um, now, you know, I don't think anyone the will had their own... get upset about that. No, I'm sorry. Many people, I don't think many people will get upset about that opinion, right? Oh, uh, <laughs> but, um, you know, I mean, I think it was a very three dimensional thought process. I mean, first of all, Tom is insane, as we know. I mean, <laughs> yeah, in the best way. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it just, he, he is, I mean, most talented actors are uh, of another planet. So, yeah. I mean, it was brilliant for him, but there's something about his psyche uh, that it, he just, he brought a, a, whether he knew it at the time or not, he brought an energy and a, and a, and a, and a nuanced sort of creation to this show that made that character very alien-like. Mm. And that's what I loved about it. Now, I mean, Peter, uh, I mean, uh, Tr uh, Peter Trouton mm. um, was, uh, I think, equally as uh, alien. You know, I mean, yeah. he was very sort of eccentric in, in his own way and I thought did a terrific job. Um, and, 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 and in a weird sort of way, Sylvester McCoy could have, had he have had, you know, the right opportunity, I thought yeah. brought a lot more to that role than he was allowed to. I mm. mean, sadly, uh, the in my personal opinion, and not, not to offend anybody, but by the time he got to play the role, he gave it his all, but the production around him was sort of falling apart. Mm. I think that's very fair to say. Um, I've seen his audition tape. He just asserts dominance right there. And there. Yeah. <laughs> just yeah, yeah. Takes over completely. He's a lovely all... man. He's just so, such a talent. He's such a talented actor. I mean, he really is. And he's such a mm. gentleman. Um, uh, yeah. I, and so, um, but, but yeah, I would, I would say, I would say it was, it was probably uh, Tom Baker. And then of course I have to say Paul McGann. Yeah. <laughs> oh, contractually Insp obliged. <laughs> Inspired casting. <laughs> but um, very quickly then before, um, I'm, I'm hopefully going to ask you about the process of getting to the TV movie, but very quickly about it. Uh, was it important for you to have Sylvester McCoy involved in that? As, as we know, he opens up the movie as the Seventh Doctor. Yes, very much so. Uh, the, the, the BBC did not want it to happen. Oh. And, um, and um, you know, there was, there was a lot of resistance to it um, at first. But uh, for me, uh, you, you know, because there were two camps, it, it was a very complicated situation because by the time I was able to get it, greenlit at Fox, mm -hmm. um, you can imagine now at this point, I had Universal Studios, uh, mm -hmm. Universal Television. I had uh, BBC, BBC Enterprises and the BBC themselves. Mm -hmm. um, and and I, had, I had Fox, um, the network. I, and so all vying for um, input into, into the process. Yeah. And so, you know, you go through all of this kicking and screaming and um, and when you're not that attached to the the, the law, you know, I, I felt that I had a, a, not only a responsibility to the fans, but uh, to the continuity of, the, of this character. And, and I felt that uh, no matter what, a regeneration was was mm -hmm. was very important. Um, because regardless of what happened to Paul, um, you know, sort of the, the, the idea to, 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 to keep that continuity, to me personally, I, I thought was very important. Does that mean if you were in charge of the 2005 reboot, you would have Paul at the beginning to change uh, into Echo? I would have. Mm. Yeah, I would have. And Paul Please. would have gladly done it. You know, yeah. he's a gentleman. Um, and he's an absolute professional. He, he would have done it. Or what they could have done is they could have picked it up and carried on with Paul and done six episodes with him and then put Eccleston in it. They could have done that as well. Absolutely. Imagine. I know like, that's oh, what a lot of fans want, isn't it? That they really want him to pick up the coat again. They want uh, He did Night of the Doctor, of course. They want a full series of McGann. We can see that with how many, how much material eight has gotten with so much spin-off stuff from all the yeah, comics yeah. and the audio stuff. And eventually Moffat gave us some of them, a little short. Wish yeah, there was more, yeah. of course I do. I mean, you know, it's like, it's one of those things, you know, when producers get their hands on um, uh, on the show, and it was interesting because um, it's not talked about a lot, but um, a re the original reboot after McGann was through BBC Wales. Yeah. And... Uh, 
they actually approach me uh, oh. to be involved. And um, I, 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 I declined, but I, um, for, for a lot of reasons, mostly personal, but um, I think that uh, the, the reality of it was, was that, um, you, you know, uh, the BBC was and is obviously a very sort of complicated institution. And, and, yeah. and when you get regime changes, you get points of view about, uh, certain content and, and, you know, not to defame anybody or, or, or be negative about it, but, but during my tenure as the producer, um, I can tell you there was not a lot of love for, uh, for Doctor Who or, or bringing it back uh, in the UK. Um, hmm. They just, they felt that it, it you know, the, they wanted the money to go elsewhere and to, to be involved in other things. There was a lot of resistance. Hmm. Um, it was really Alan Yentop um, who was my, um, he was he, he was really the key to all of it and personally responsible for believing in me and supporting me and that's how it really got done wonderful um uh, i did before uh, coming on here hear a little bit about alan's contribution to it i know he'd been bringing star trek to the bbc and stuff like that at the time so he really yeah, saw good. the value of sci-fi you know He's not an unsung hero, then. We'll people know about him, yeah. A little bit, yeah. I don't, I don't know. I don't. Well, you know, Alan still wanders the halls of the BBC. It's interesting. I know he does a documentary series on on all kinds of very interesting stuff, very, um, you know, very artsy kind of stuff, a lot of music stuff, and he, he sort of is an on camera host. He's it's, it's really interesting. Um, but I haven't spoken to him in, in many years, uh, mm -hmm. but I know uh, that, yes, he, well, he was a believer in, in great content and, and the creative process, and he loved passion. And, um, and I think my passion at the time uh, was, was something that he really gravitated towards, uh, be, because at the time I was trying to launch it, uh, the movie rights had been given away to another company and they were desperately trying to raise the funds to, uh, to do this movie. Um, and there's, there's all this sort of backstory and, and behind the scenes stuff that was going on as I was trying, you know, uh, uh, desperately to, to finally get the BBC to say yes. Um, and they were, uh, at the time, hanging on uh, because of this movie. They didn't want to interfere with the film, and they thought if the film goes, they weren't, certainly weren't going to give me the rights to do a television show. Yeah. And yeah. at the last minute, there, were, there was a contractual obligation in which they uh, had, uh, they were at the end of their last option on the material. Hmm. and uh, they needed a director, and they needed to be in pre-production. So cleverly, they went and made an offer to Leonard Nimoy. Huh? And um, what happened was they made an offer to him, but they never actually consummated the deal, and they stopped talking to him. It was all sort of very strange and desperate. And so finally, when the option expired and I was able to get the rights, um, I found myself having uh, a meeting with Leonard Nimoy, who thought wow. that it was me who was making him an oh, offer yeah. to direct <laughs> to, to, to direct the show. Wow. And I was certainly intrigued. And, and um, at one point, he actually thought about actually playing the doctor. Ooh. And so it was all too sort of overwhelming for me at that minute because mm. I was you know, trying to sort of juggle politics and, and uh, trying to manage it all and get it all on track. So yeah. it, was a, it was a crazy moment in time. Mm. Yeah, it Can sounds I... like it. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Uh, I think that company was Dalton Rays. I think the other company was. There's a lot of rumours about them trying to get Dalton people like... Dalton Rays. Yes. And they were trying to get people like David Bowie involved and things like that. And they That's were... right. Yeah. Yeah. They, 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 they had had the, they had had the rights for quite a few years, um, mm. and just it was, it, it was that moment in time where I think everybody was sort of fatigued on Doctor Who, mm. um, but um, you know, listen, uh, you know, fate played a, a, a positive hand to me, so mm -hmm. I, I was able to get the rights. Mm. Uh, the next question is sort of talking about the journey of getting the rights and making the show. When did you first inquire? When did you first start that ball rolling about working, uh, 
working on a Doctor Who show, movie, what have you? Well, actually, I wrote a book about this, you know, Doctor Who Regeneration. I know yes. it's not readily available very much anymore, but the whole, uh, it, it actually took seven years. Seven years. For me to get the rights. I, um, I was a young uh, executive at Columbia Pictures Television mm -hmm. when I started writing uh, to uh, the BBC. And, and w when I started inquiring, we didn't have email. <laughs> <laughs> so uh you couldn't you couldn't instantly you know connect with anybody um oh, and oh, so yeah. it sounds strange right i mean in my it, it, we were sort of having this conversation we were in my day, but um that's basically what it was and so i i did a, a letter writing campaign and you'd wait for a letter to return you know and i would send letters on columbia pictures television letterhead so they knew it was an official inquiry and off we went, you know, and, and they would bounce me around from person to person. And, and they'd say, well, the person you need to have a call with is this person. And I'd say, okay, great. When can I have that call? And, you know, I was a dog with a bone and it um, drove them crazy. It just drove them crazy. But I mean, you know, um, everybody has their own sort of way of, of approaching these things. But if you really are, are passionate about something and you want something, I always believed that, you know, no meant yes. And mm. I had a pretty thick skin about these things. And, you know, I just didn't care. Um, what was the worst they could do is say no yeah. or go away. But, you know, um, they were intrigued, I think, because it was mm. America and uh, because it was a major studio asking. And so I was, I, I was able to engage them in conversations, but I, I learned very quickly uh, that a lot of it was just sort of waste uh, time wasting because they wanted to respond because that was the professional thing to do. Yeah. But they also really had no interest in moving it forward. Mm. Was there any contact with you and the producer of Doctor Who from the 80s, John Nathan Turner at all, or any official discussions with people within the show? Um, I... I had, well, um, I had, yes, I had a lovely uh, conversation with, with uh, John Nathan Turner. Um, it was delightful. Mm -hmm. um, it, was, it wasn't very long, um, mm -hmm. but he was, he, was, he was lovely. And he was very friendly and, uh, you know, and he, any help that he could be, he was happy to be. Yeah. Um, so that was, that was, that was that really. I had a wonderful, con I had several conversations actually with Verity Lambert. Oh. Hey, who, uh, she, yes, she was the very first producer of yeah. Doctor Who. Of course. And uh, she, was, she was wonderful and very insightful because, you know, um, I think that, um, I think what Jonathan and, uh, both Verity and I'm sure a lot of the other producers uh, shared in common was this idea of great character, let's find some great stories and, and put them in a great world. I mean, I think everybody did everything they could to advance the ball, as it were, and, mm. and produce something that they, they, want, they believed in. And um, so, you know, as the years go on, the behind the scenes that the, the, the challenges that producers have uh, make it very difficult. And some of the decisions they make, not often great ones, are forced upon them by budgetary issues, political yeah. issues, and everything else. Mm. Uh, yeah, 100%. Uh, yeah. During that time, um, am I right in saying it went to three different um, big production companies during this time when you were with the, when you were um, getting the rights when you had the rights and then when it actually came out so it would have been DreamWorks right DreamWorks and then was it well, Amblin yeah it, it was Amblin actually DreamWorks didn't exist uh, oh. I, I was the head of television for Amblin I, I, wor I worked for Spielberg for six years wow and I thought if, if anybody could get the rights to Doctor Who, it was Steven Spielberg. And mm. so um, what, what happened was, was I uh, was producing, I, I had created a show um, called Sequest. Mm. And uh, in those days, the, uh, they were called the May screenings and all the various sort of studio heads would come out to Hollywood and they would screen 
uh, the pilots uh, and make a decision as to whether or not they were going to invest in or buy these shows. Hmm. And uh, I got a call in my office one morning from the head of uh, Universal Studios saying that Alan Yentob was in town and he wanted to take a tour of the Sequest sets. And oh. would I be kind enough to personally give him a tour? Well, <laughs> yeah. I thought this is fantastic. You know, the, uh, the fox has walked into the hen house and I have the key <laughs> to the hen house, right? <laughs> so uh, I said, absolutely, uh, what time? And they told me what time. And I said, well, I'll tell you what, have him come down to Amblin and um, I thought I'd do the full court press, you know, I'd have him meet Stephen and then I'd put him on a, one of our golf courts and take him up to the stages. We were on nine stages. Wow. And so I did a full court press, but the poor man didn't realize that I was less interested in pitching Sequest to him than I was about getting the rights to Dr. <laughs> Hope. And, and, and so for the next hour and a half, I'm, I'm sort of going, yes, okay, this is stage 28, and this is where, you know, the, uh, the bridge is, and, mm -hmm. you know, that. oh, and by the way, you know, Doctor Who, <laughs> and I, went, I drove him crazy, and I literally decided he was not leaving, he was not leaving yeah. my presence until he had said yes, and the poor man, I got a yes out of him. And so that, that's, how, that's how it all sort of started, but, mm -hmm. and then, um, I was, uh, you know, I had to sort of set about uh, writing and because our deal was with Universal um, uh, in those days, uh, I, it's not this way today, but in those days, Universal Pictures, Universal um, had um, distribution, uh, had a distribution deal with Amblin and obviously yep. Amblin was on the uh, Universal lot for all kinds of reasons. And uh, so they had a first look at everything in television and they financed 100% of everything we did, but only got 50% of the, of, the, of, the, of the revenue. So it was a great deal for Stephen, not yeah. such a great deal for, for, for them, but they were, they were happy to do it. And so they forced, you know, they forced writers on me. Now, I don't mean, I don't say this to, to denigrate John Leakley, who was the first person mm. to, to write a script. But, you know, I didn't have a lot of, I, I couldn't make cho choices in terms of who I wanted to write. I was sort of, mm. these people were thrust upon me and I had to mm. find, you know, the people that I thought potentially got it and understood it. But the John Leakley script, unfortunately, John wrote a script that looked, that read and looked way too much like Raiders of the Lost Ark. Yeah. And so, yeah. um, so that's, so that's what's popular that I, I right now syndrome. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. So Stephen said, I, I don't really want, want to do this. And, and so um, I put a, um, uh, another writer on it that they gave me by the name of De Laurentiis. Yeah. And um, he, he uh, unfortunately, um, didn't get it right either. Mm. And, um, and so we sort of languished for, for a while. And it wasn't until I, I left uh, Amblin, actually, and I, I had taken an overall deal at Paramount, um, that things started to bubble again. And um, I, I was able to, to get Fox to, to pay attention. And uh, we were able to, to put Matthew Jacobs on it, who at the time um, I really enjoyed. When you were telling people about how Doctor Who should be, what kind of eras of the show were coming to mind uh, when you wanted to present well, that idea? Well, as you idea can appreciate, you know, for me, obviously, all I had was the, the 760 episodes that were already produced. Yeah. Um, and, you know, if you didn't know anything about Doctor Who, you can imagine it was a little bit of a, of a brain yeah. freeze for people to to try to understand oh, yeah. this character and, and, and you know, he's, his sort of travels and what he really was all about and what was his fascination with Earth and specifically, you know, London. Yeah. Um, but... Uh, that isn't budget. But, but, I, but, I, but, you know, I think that for me, uh, what happened during the Tom Baker years, I thought there, there was an awful lot of stuff going on that I thought was very rich. 
and they tried a lot of things that I thought were a lot of fun. You know, it, it, if you go back and think about um, series like The Talons of Wang Chayan, yeah. um, and how wonderful that was, a very Victorian film, and then that sort of Chinese uh, kind of mob background that I thought was, was really, really yeah. fun and interesting. And of course, you know, discovering the, the old uh, TARDIS console room and and giving us notions of how big the TARDIS was, you know, uh, uh, scenes in which he and, and um, I think Liz was his companion at the time, were walking around, you know, back cor corridors of the TARDIS, but they, they only found like a costume room and things like that. Yeah. They, they really tried to expand the universe in ways that we hadn't really seen before. If you really think about it, you know, if you really analyze Doctor Who, um, it was really only the Tom Baker years that we really got that, that sort of expansion of, of the universe. All yeah. the other Doctors that had come before, there was a very sort of myopic kind of narrative that was going on. And in, in fact, with the Pertwee years, you know, poor John was stuck with no budget and, you know, yeah. he wasn't allowed to fly around in the TARDIS, so he took it away from it. They slapped him on so, Earth, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I would have to say, it, uh, most of it, most of it came from for for the purposes of getting everybody on board, uh, which was really a key to me. Um, mm. I, I made everybody look at the Tom Baker era. I figured there'd be Tom Baker influence. There was flat out jelly babies in the film, after all. Yeah, <laughs> well, that was that was that was you know it was interesting. Paul was it was very important to Paul at the time to 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 sort of. Um, find a way to really breathe, live and breathe in this character. And I think at first he had a difficult time trying to sort of figure out where I wanted him to go with the character. And, mm. um, and, and, and it was interesting if you, in the movie, the scene in which, you know, he's with Grace at her apartment, and, you know, he sort of starts to think about, remember, some, he's starting to remember things. We talked an awful lot about that scene and we rehearsed that scene for a couple of days and it was it was quite a struggle for him and I sort of went for a walk with him and all this stuff and I said to him, you know, it, it, it was very important that he, he sort of let go of any preconceived notions and, and bring a lot to it. But remember that, you know, he's trying to put himself in the mind of an alien, you know, yeah. and trying to put himself in the mind of someone who's just gone through this very traumatic experience mm -hmm. and he's trying to sort of rebuild his brain. Um, and, um, and so, um, it, it, it was really trying to, um, to, to do all of those things, but I was also, I have to tell you, I was a big fanboy. And so all of the things that I did, I, I, I did for my own, you know, because I, I, I sort of, I didn't know whether people would roll their eyes or whether people would, would say, oh, that's great. You know, that's a great touch. I, you know, you never know. Yeah. I think it's quite nice when he sees the scarf, you know, when he's looking for his clothes and what have you, you see the scarf is in there. Oh, there's tons of Easter eggs. They're yeah. all over the place, aren't yeah. they? I couldn't keep up with them. Yeah. Um, yeah coming up. Fun. And in the TARDIS itself, we don't get, you don't really get to see it, you know, because mm. the, the, the TARDIS console room set I thought was beautiful. But, you know, mm. I had, I had uh, Patrick Troughton's flute was there. Mm. Uh, the 900 Year Diary was there. Yeah. Um, there was uh, a, a, a hat and coat and gloves from uh, mm -hmm. from uh, uh, from the from the first Doctor. You know, I, yeah. I I had fun with it. You would have had Bessie there if you could. <laughs> by the sounds of <laughs> no, it, I, I probably would have. That's true. Yeah. I tell you what, um, because of how varied Doctor Who can be, with well, with everything, the setting, the sub-genres, the main character even, coming up with one cinematic story to really represent it that could please old fans and attract a new audience, it can't have been easy. So how did you go about it? <clears throat> no, it was very difficult because um, I couldn't be too far out there because only fans of the show and those who had followed the show would understand what we were doing. I had to actually... Um, do this for uh, uh, an audience and assume that the people that I was really playing to had never seen Doctor Who, didn't know who he was, and um, 
but I also had to try and make it appealing to the fans and those who were excited about a new episode. So that was a real challenge. And unfortunately it put me in, in, in a very difficult position. And budget was also a challenge for me as well, because originally I wanted to do Doctor Who and the Daleks um, for all kinds of reasons. Um, but, um, you know, I think that one of the, one of the key things was that, uh, the, the, a, a, rege, a, a regeneration is a great opportunity to reset the character and to learn an awful lot about a character because he's coming out of a regeneration and he doesn't really know, you know, we don't know what he's going to remember or not remember and what his physicality is going to be like and, and um, what, he, what he really feels and thinks as he sort of comes out of this regeneration. So that was a great opportunity to sort of give the audience uh, a, a setting. And then of course, you know, um, the challenge was uh, the network wanting something that they felt was um, familiar, but, but also that, that, that created a very simple ticking clock. Uh, because in in the uh, you know in the nineties right then form, formula was a very very important part of yeah of of the network, and so <clears throat> that was a challenge as well. Um, and and so you know we we obviously um, we we put in these elements about uh, uh, about sort of the, the the sort of end of the world dominance. But the key to this story really was the relationship between the doctor and the master. Yeah. And the idea here was to simply show that through time and space, doctor, the doctor's enemies uh, were, were sometimes very vindictive and would do anything they could to, to, to sort of destroy the very person that they thought was in their way of, of you know, of, um, of universal dominance. And so yeah. um, I thought that the, this sort of character play between the doctor and the master was a really great way for us to humanize the show for those who didn't know anything about it, um, and and also um, you, you know t tell a story that 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 felt familiar, um, because one of the challenges you always have, especially with creatures like the Daleks, is they're faceless, and so the enemy yeah. is, is there's no emotional contact for the audience, and so um, it's very difficult for an audience, I think, to sort of get in get get involved with uh, a creature or a monster that is faceless in that regard so mm -hmm. so there were all kinds of challenges but it was primarily to sort of um think about how we reset things and and, and tell this story but also give people a sense of who he was through the tardis itself which was a huge character and you know mm -hmm. and and that allowed us to explain a lot about uh, time travel and and, um, and and those sorts of things. Mm. Then, I like how, um, oh, what's his name now? Why do I forget it now? <laughs> the, the Asian child. Oh, he, oh, oh, he makes, we, he makes, yes. that's it. He makes you, for a so, very, yeah. Uh, yeah, for quite a, a deadpan audience surrogate. I remember how he goes right into the TARDIS. He sees it's big on the inside. He just goes, no, no, if, no, it isn't. Bloody hell, let me have another look. He just walks around right. again. Well, and we did that gag, and we did the gag of the police, of the cop on the motorcycle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> really you, like, you've got to uh, have... You gotta have a human looking into the TARDIS and being in disbelief. Yeah, <laughs> right. I just, right. I just love how he immediately doubts himself and immediately goes back. Yeah, uh, yeah. Well, I mean, you know, the TARDIS is one of those those great iconic things, and yes. um, you know, um, I, I tell the story in the book about how that they didn't want the the, the police box. They uh, the network said they. Just nobody will get it. Nobody cares. Yeah. It can be anything. You know, let's make a cool spaceship. And I said, no, no, no. I said, and besides which, you know, it's it's not a very American thing. And I said, yeah, um, actually, you're wrong. Uh, the police box was invented in New York City in 18, I think in 1893. <laughs> Um, and then it ended up um, being used by the uh, Metropolitan Police Department in in, in the UK. Yeah. Uh, so once they became realized prepared that it, it was actually that an American thing, they go, oh, okay, all right, it's American, yeah. that's fine. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> and, I, and again, stuff like that was central. Uh, certainly when, when I was a, a kid and I was shown, but there was a Doctor Who movie, 
Um, you know, knowing that things like the Daleks, um, at least were mentioned in it, you heard them very briefly, knowing the Master was in it, seeing that that blue police box, all that was very important. We've got to know, what do you think of the Dalek voices in this, in the movie? In, 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 my, in my movie? Yeah. Mm. Well, um, unfortunately, I did, you know, it's one of those things where on the day that that was recorded, I wasn't there. Right so, there, we go. Um, I think that explains yeah, it. You know, I mean, and, and I, and it's like you know, you get an oh well, and no time to fix it, and all this yeah. nonsense. You know, and 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 it, I have to own it. You know, yeah, it's on my watch, and it is what it is. Um, mm -hmm. And there wasn't really uh, there was there was more to uh, unfortunately there was a lot more to that scene than yeah. ended up in the movie. Oh, really? And <laughs> yeah, um, and and so. Um, you know, it was it was really it was really difficult because originally we had Daleks actually um, we had a whole scene with Daleks and the Master, yeah. um, and and them actually giving um, uh, they were actually uh, they were actually handing over the Master to uh, to the Doctor. Wow! And um, for for some uh, for some um, future. Uh, bargaining chip that we don't learn about, uh, we don't know about in this story, but we, we were supposed to learn about it later. There was a bargaining yeah. chip of some kind. Right. What would you um, have liked the, So, what would you have liked the so Daleks that, to Yeah, unfortunately, like? you know, that all got cut out. Mm. What would say, you have liked the Daleks to look like mm. in this film? If you had because, total creative control of it. Uh, just to throw in really well, quick, the Daleks. Oh, go on, sorry. There's um, some designs out there oh, online of like spider type Daleks. Oh, that's right. That's yeah. right. Those Daleks, that's what they would have looked like. And right. In my mind, they were this very, very kind of organic mm. um, creature that had a skin. So if you could imagine that they were able to, a la, you think about uh, Transformers. Yes. Yeah. That, they were, uh, that they were able to take themselves and put themselves in a shell. If you think about octopus, <clears throat> you know, if you've ever had a chance to look at octopus, Mm -hmm. And how they're able to actually go into the into the sand, and they they use their their suction cups, and they suck mm -hmm. up all of the material around them, and they become a rock, and you don't see what they they are. Mm -hmm. So I always had this idea that these creatures, um, sort of, it was it would have been a lot more organic. They would have had that familiar yeah. looking shell when they wanted to move around, so that they were protected. Uh, but the the creature inside, which which sort of could come out of its shell, you know, when you think about a tortoise coming out of its shell, or you yes. think a snail coming out of its shell. So in nature, there are all these examples of how creatures use armor, uh, shells, and armor as part of, as part of their sort of being. And so that was the that was the original concept. Ooh. I'd imagine it would have been important to show that they are not robots. Because yes. that's a common uh, newbie yeah, misconception uh, right there that they are living things. That's right, and they are. I mean, they were supposed to be anyway. I mean, you know, and if we remember, if you go back in time and you think about it, you know, the, the Daleks were given two, um, you know, two stories of their, uh, you know, of, of how they came about um, in the in the in the feature film. You know, well, and they they carried this on a little bit there were the dolls and the thals right yeah so the thals and the dolls and they fought each other and then the the dolls ended up um you know sort of going into these uh, into these creature shells to to survive this apocalyptic uh, war and doll dalek the doll dalek that's where that came from and then mm -hmm. of course in later years we had the 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 davros uh, um, story and you know and that backstory and the, and and how this mad scientist uh, decided to take over the world um, and and I think that um, you know somewhere between the two uh, we could have we can still there's still a lot of story to be mined there yes. um, but I I always felt it was important that the villains have a, a um, you know they have a humanity for lack of a better word, uh, to them, you know, that, mm. that they had a relatability, that they were organic uh, things as well from their worlds. And an intelligence, the idea that he's a yeah, absolutely. Shepherd, just planning, yeah, yeah.
Absolutely. Yes. The doctor's a thinker. Have, have him go against thinkers. Yeah. So That's very, right. To very quickly um, add, add into that then, um, looking at things like the Leakley Bible and what we've seen of it online and from the book that you mentioned as well, um, was it true that you were? Um, was it true that you were going to uh, lift certain story elements from the actual show's past and try and present them in a new way? For instance, I think there was something about the abominable snowmen being remade with the Yeti and stuff like that. Well, uh, I mean, the Bible itself. What I mm. had to do, p- part of what what I had to do was I had to demonstrate the story and the character had legs Mm. and um what the bible actually sought to do was to um to to sort of give you a taste of some of the great worlds that we had been to that we could possibly revisit again and i think that you know look my feeling was was that um when you have 760 episodes of something um, you can look at it as a ver- as a positive. A lot of talented people, whether you like their work or not, whether you think it was deep enough, whether you think it was right or wrong, you know, everything is open to subjectivity and, and, and everybody's opinion, I think, counts. Yeah. But what counted to me more than anything was that body of work should, <laughs> should be used as as a jumping off point for opportunities in the future. I mean, why would you not? Especially when you've got a writing staff, if you're going to launch, you know, with young writers or, um, yeah. in the US who may not have grown up with Doctor Who, they desperately need something to hook into. And so when you mm-hmm. can show them that universe and say, look, you know, the world is your oyster, but here's a jumping off point. I, mm-hmm. I think you eliminate a lot of stress and anxiety on the part of a writing staff that. Yeah. that may get writer's blog. I mean, that was one of the challenges I had with Leakley and De Laurentiis. You know, it's like mm-hmm. getting them to watch the show was like pulling teeth because it's like, no, no, you, you've got to watch the show. Yeah. It, it, because if you don't watch the show, you're never going to understand um, the length, depth and breadth of, of what each producer and each doctor's stories brought to the world. And mm-hmm. by understanding that, you can use that as a jumping off point to go wherever you want. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Um, the, fi- the final point I have really about the Leakley and De Laurentiis um, versions, um, there was the idea that the Doctor and the Master would be brothers, something that was in the show initially, uh, but they edited out. There was the idea of uh, Ulysses being the Doctor's father and him going on the quest um, really goes on. Uh, how much of that do you think... Fi- or rather, how much the focal point would that have been in the series had we seen it? You know, the, the idea of... Well, the here's, what I'll say, here's what I'll say about that, because I mm. think it's very important. And I've, mm. I, and I've uh, I, you know, honestly, I've not watched an awful lot of the new, new mm. shows going forward. So I, uh, if I'm speaking out of turn, forgive me and, and please, please correct me. But mm. the Doctor's relationship with Gallifrey was very important to me. Yeah. And I really, had I had the opportunity to really explore that more, I would have. Because, you know, if you think about these origin stories, what's the difference between the Doctor leaving Gallifrey or being sent away from Gallifrey as he was in, in mm. you know, uh, then, then Superman uh, being sent from, from Krypton to Earth, you know, the, the, you, its planet was destroyed. So you have these, these intelligent creatures, you have these, these human, or these, these uh, aliens, I should say, from, a, from another world, their world, you know, and these things get explored in all kinds of ways. Look at Spock with, um, you know, Planet Vulcan and the stories we've yeah. seen about him going home and how, how religion entered into it and his life force and how he uh, regenerates, which is very interesting, by the way. I'm not <laughs> saying they didn't take it from us, but I think they did. Um, but my point is this, is that Gallifrey to me was something I really wanted to explore. Yeah. And, you know, I, I, I feel like... Um, um, when you when you think about what time lords were and mm-hmm. and how they were um, put into this sort of council and there there was this hierarchy in the council yeah. and there there were uh, you know there were rules and there there were decisions that were made about the Gallifreyan society by this hierarchical group. I mean, and that was all kind of. 
uh, given to us in the Baker years. And, and so I thought that if we were able to really understand some of those things and connect him to this world, it would have made him a much richer character. And so it was very important to me, you know, who was his father? Uh, who was his mother? Um, you know, what is this thing would they have two hearts? Um, and why, why is it that in 760 episodes, most of them were, you know, a lot of them, if not two thirds of them, set in, in London, in England. I and mean, what was that fascination? I wanted to root it in something that gave it a, a reason why, you know, that why was there this, this, this decision for him to go to this particular place? And so yeah. that's where the root of the Leakley story really came from, that his father had this passion for this world, this, these, the, these creatures. He loved, you know, he loved the human experience, the human touch. Yeah. And so it was not the first time that a TARDIS had broken and, you know, it's, mm. it, it wasn't able to fly. I mean, obviously we got that um, in, in the Pertwee years where, yes. where they uh, originally, I think they, they took his time rotor away from him. Um, but um, so I, I, I'm, I love storytelling and, and mm. I, I thought that if someone had taken the trouble to write all of this stuff, I wanted to explore it and push yeah. the boundaries and ask questions and, and try to get a little more out of it. Mm. And, then, and then it's a bit of a shame, therefore, that Gallifrey's gone again in the new series. You don't yeah. have to comment on that. Yeah, no, but it's... I just have to vent about that because uh, I was waiting yeah. for it throughout my childhood. We've yeah. grown up with New Who. I was yeah, waiting yeah. for Gallifrey to come back because my dad would tell me about how great it was. And they brought it back yeah. in a special, and then it's destroyed off screen again. Oh, come on. Yeah. So much yeah. development that you could have had there. Yeah. Especially post time. No, great. I mean, listen, this is this is a, a, a culture in a world, and the doctor is one of many, many uh yeah. Uh, many, many, you know, time lords. Uh, mm. You know, it's like James Bond, right? I mean, there's 007, but you know, once in a while we we see another double O, but they're usually killed. Yeah. <laughs> it's like if it's like if MI6 was destroyed for yeah. a while and then yeah. it's brought back, but then it's destroyed again. Yeah. Oh, I mean, <laughs> it's so jump. Me, oh, on that one. I mean, I, I'm really one of those people who get so sick of, oh, he's, re you know, he's retired. Oh, he's been fired. Oh, he, yeah. you know, tell a bloody story. It was, yeah. You know, what, whatever happened to From Russia With Love, you know, mm. uh, th those, those great spy, spy novels. It's like, why, why, why don't, you know, constantly, oh, well, I don't know, we'll, We'll have him quit, and and they'll have to. Well. Only I always prefer it when they add to the mythology. Yeah, rather than shy away that. from it. Well, that's yeah. be, because you know what the truth is. That's harder. That yeah. takes mm. energy and it yeah. takes time. And I, I, I'm I'm sorry, with all due respect, most writers that I've met and worked with, you know, they can be lazy. Uh, they mm. can be incredibly talented, but they can be lazy. And, you know, writing is about life experience. And most great writers, they write from what they know. They write from yeah. life experience. And writing is not like riding a bicycle. You know, you don't get, you, if you don't write every day, you mm. lose that muscle and you lose that skill. And when you're writing something like Doctor Who, if you don't genuinely love it and are yeah. passionate about it, and you have a showrunner who wants to uh, push those boundaries, you, you mm. just, you don't get there. They all, mm. it, it's all becomes ho-hum and, well, what do we do this week? Mm. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And it would have been, some would have said it would have been ideal to be as traditional as possible if it's the first movie, but you weren't afraid to introduce new stuff. The Eye of Harmony, the Half Doctor thing. All the Half Human, yeah. You move the story forward. We had a new Doctor and everything. And yeah. Well, thank you. I mean, I tried. I mean, I know there's a lot of haters out there who... Uh, mm -hmm. you know, rolled their eyes and, and, and did all that. And that's fine. I mean, listen, and I respect that. And I understand. Oh, yeah. I mean, it, there, like I said, there's no right way or wrong way. But I, I, I wanted to make him as complicated as possible. Yeah. And I wanted to connect him to Earth in a way that I felt was very visceral. And that's mm -hmm. why I made the decisions I made. Yeah, I think... Mm -hmm. Liking Doctor Who 100% of the time is just not part of the deal. <laughs> no, there's yeah. lots of decisions. It embodies um, change that much. So, absolutely. Like, there's and, a lot and you can people. always move on. Mm. Like, if you don't like a current run, you can just, just come back. 100%. There's a lot of, right now in the chibble. Yeah, there's a lot of people who don't like the current one because um, 
very parallel to the TV movie. They've tried very hard to add things in. But mm-hmm. in, in this particular one, I don't think it's come off as well, in, in, my, in my humble opinion. Anyway. It's also about execution, yeah. not just concepts, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Well, look, uh, you know, here's what I would say about that. Um, you know, um, I, I think that one of the challenges you always have is it's not just the creative team themselves, but it's yeah. the politics behind the business of the mm-hmm. business. And um, one of the one of the things that we will never, um, you know, we, we don't care about as fans is the business aspect of it is, is mm. um, who's, you know, the, the monetization of this. Somebody spends X amount of dollars to make something. Yeah. Somebody wants, uh, you know, to get recompense for it. I mean, that's why the BBC created BBC Enterprises, which is now something else. I don't know what it is now, because there was a loophole in BBC Charter that said, you know, it said you can't, you can't sell things for a profit, BBC. But there's nothing stopping you from owning a company that can. Yeah. And that's how they were then able to take all of their uh, content and exploit it. Um, and look, and that's the same with Doctor Who. If you're going to spend X amount of dollars, I mean, I, I have no idea what the budget is today on Doctor Who. But I can tell you that, you know, if it's not monetized, they won't make it. Yeah. yeah. It's easy to say as a fan, isn't it obvious to bring the Daleks in? And to, but there's all the executive... Uh, decisions behind the scenes as well and yeah. it probably gets more complicated if it's another country that we're talking about as well yeah yeah very, very much so um you know um but you know i don't know it was interesting i was sitting around the other day talking to my wife going God, you know what are we going to watch you know I'm, I'm so hungry for science fiction and so much of it is just you know for, for me it's just it just doesn't doesn't cut it anymore. It's really sad. Mm. Do you know what it is you're looking for exactly? That's a good question. You know, because sometimes um, I don't know until I see it. Yeah, well, that's true. But look, for me, it, it's it's give me great characters, mm-hmm. give me a story, and take me to a place I've never been before. Mm-hmm. and uh show me you know the challenges and i'm i am very open i'm i'm not a snob you know i'm more fantasy than science fiction i read jules verne as a kid not asimov so i'm very yeah. much more in the fantasy scape than i am but mm-hmm. i i appreciate and love you know great worlds i mean if you want to go back in time to the 80s and talk about alien uh yeah. or you go all the way forward to cameron now you know doing more avatar and everything in between mm. um I, i'm i'm a big big lover i mean i thought i thought um matt damon's martian was a great film i really yeah. did still gotta say that um, i still gotta say that oh you've got to see it it's it's a great film and it's it's really well done visually um, my god but yeah. um the yeah, yeah, but um, but you know, there's been other Mac, uh, there's been other stories that that just didn't cut it for me. I don't know. Science fiction to me is it's 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 a it's a it, it, it's a taste thing, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, yeah. we all um, we all have our own different kind of values and tastes about what it is that you know do we want it more gory less gory you know i mean it's all all of that one of the things i really look forward to is if you're able to go to a different world and yeah that's right just like new york city again as part of why i prefer dc comics over marvel because you get metropolis and gotham instead of just new york i don't know if you know much about that just some just an example from top of your head give me a whole yeah but i mean i mean that's one of the strengths slow man yeah, I mean, Interstellar, Rain, Interstellar. You remember the movie Interstellar? Yes. And the Ranger goes to that planet, and they're and they're in that, and then they see the water coming. It was fantastic. I mean, I don't know. Uh, it doesn't take a lot to hook me, but mm. I, I want, I like you. I want to go to another. Take me someplace I've never been before. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And America was a place that Doctor Who wasn't before. It does count. Yeah. And it was interesting, yeah. actually. Yeah. I mean, um, yeah, you know, we setting it in San Francisco, you know, for all kinds of reasons. We mm. we, we love Chinatown. I mean, we love, mm. you know, there were there were all kinds of things we were we were trying trying to do. Um, 
And I think we got most of it. I'm very, very proud of that film. Uh, you know, I look at it and yeah. some of it really holds up. Some of it doesn't. But, you know, that, that, that's, that, that is what it is. And it's got a legitimate legacy because Paul McGann is still the eighth Doctor and he is absolutely beloved. Yeah. And another thing that's beloved is the opening theme. We haven't talked about that. It's really oh, good. The, the soundtrack generally oh, is you. just <laughs> wonderful. Uh, yes. who, who actually composed it, if you don't mind my asking? Couldn't find this. So it was John, it was John Debney. Mm. And you know what's interesting about that is I've not seen John for years and years and years. And he did an interview in 2013 where he completely dissed me. I mean, completely forgot who, you know, how he got that assignment, which was really oh. fascinating. You know, I mean, I love John, yeah. but um, I've not seen him in years. But, um, you know, uh, one, of the, one of the things that um, I worked really hard on was making sure that that main title theme was, was really Doctor Who. Yes. It also had its own kind of, hook to mm. it because mm. we needed to use p parts of it for you know we were going to use parts of it obviously for, for for the series had it have gone on yeah but you know this story i mean when i was right in the middle of com uh, working on the composition i found out that we we didn't have the rights to it oh so that the bbc had actually sold the main title theme uh they'd sold it to a warner chapel music Oh. And so without Warner Chapel's permission, we couldn't use Doctor Who. Hmm. So that was crazy. And, it, it, and I, spent, uh, I spent a fortune um, actually trying, uh, well, to get permission. I mean, you know, it, was, uh, it cost a lot of money yeah. um, to, to, to get permission to actually use the, the thing. I mean, this was true of Doc, uh, the BBC with a lot of things. I mean, they gave a lot of the creatures the rights away to the writers. Yeah, and yeah. Terry Nation uh, owned the, the rights to the Daleks yep. and, and on and on and on. So, I mean, it was, it, was a, it was a very goofy thing, you know, trying to put all that back together again, just so that you could have you know, Doctor Who. Yeah, yeah, that sounds that sounds like very a mess. painful. Yeah, uh, how it's like, broken into little fragments like that. Yeah, we've been I've oh, been interviewing a lot nightmare. of people lately, and a lot of them, uh, people I've been interviewing, have been content producers of Doctor Who in the nineties or uh, fan films in the nineties, let's say. And they were just and they've able talked about to, the rights. Yeah, a lot. So you've got let's say the Zygons. Someone was just able to ask, and they were able to use the Zygons, Sontarans, and things like that. You know, they just. Um, they had, but they couldn't go right. to BBC for them. Very interesting. Right. And people would ask them for it back. Yeah. <laughs> and they have that position right. of power. And they could have exploited it, but yeah, <laughs> yeah, deserted not to. Hmm. But uh, again, on that, the point rights of... to the Daleks are quite infamous, aren't they? Oh, absolutely. For one, Doctor yeah. mm. Doctor still don't technically own that, which is interesting. No. Yeah. No, they never will. Terry Nation, the, the estate of Terry Nation does. And, yeah. you know, if I was them, I wouldn't let go of them either. I mean, it's, you know, it's a, it's a cash cow if they want to use them. A true arch enemy of Doctor Who in every way then, aren't they? <laughs> Behind the scenes and on the screen. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Yeah. But, no, just to, uh, again to compliment the, uh, some other things about this movie, the casting was wonderful. Paul McGann is, in my opinion, absolute masterstroke and because... He's used a lot in Big Finish and stuff like that today. I think a lot of people would agree with that. How did the casting... Eric Roberts as yeah. well. Oh, yeah. Uh, but, uh, that I'll guy come... just owned it, didn't he? Yeah. It's just... Well, he wasn't the first choice. I mean, uh, the network wanted, insisted on Christopher Lloyd. Mm. Yeah. And so to be a master, we actually made an offer to Christopher Lloyd, but his schedule uh, did not permit him to... Uh, to yeah. actually um to do it so we went to eric roberts um but you know the doctor i mean uh and i talk about this in the book there were i mean i met with everybody from eric idol to uh, you know obviously you know we talked about leonard nimoy and, yeah. and there was everybody in between i mean people like i can't even remember any anymore um but um we went to we went through a lot of lists i mean michael crawford was my original choice yes um and uh, he passed he passed on the project but you know <clears throat> i had seen with with nail and i and mm. um for me <laughs> love that about movie. paul's uh, his eyes you know yeah. the eyes i mean there's something about him that was incredibly 
I don't know. It was just otherworldly, and mm. he just haunted me. You just could not get him out of your. You couldn't get him out of your head. And yeah. um, and and I had um, I had a lot of help from uh, a woman by the name of Joe Wright, who was an executive at at the BBC. She was very supportive of me and um, the decision making, you know. Um, and so um, I, I'm really I have to say thank you to her again for oh, yeah. supporting a lot of the decisions I wanted to make. Mm, absolutely. Absolutely. Oh, what was your ca- uh, question about the cast before I burst oh. in and said, Eric Roberts, yeah! Oh, no, it was just about the ca- casting poll. Oh, and, no. And, mm. and how... Uh, how we well, uh, go on, say. There you are. Well, I mean, you know, it was one of those things where, um, you know, it, when you go over the shock of actually getting the rights and you know you're going to make Doctor Who and you have a script and it's like, okay, now you've got to make the bloody thing. And it's like, you know, now you start to panic, you know, a lot of sleepless nights. Mm -hmm. But the casting process was really a lot of fun. And, um, you know, it all it all sort of fell into place uh, when I met Paul. And, you know, when I first met Paul, he had gorgeous, long flowing hair. I mean, his hair was down to his, I mean, he looked great, you know, and I, and, um, and I, I, um, when we finally had, had made him the offer and I had a chance to talk to him on the phone, I said, I really look forward to, to working with you. I said, do not cut that hair. Yeah. <laughs> and of course he um, went off and, and did yeah. uh, for, for a movie. And then I had to spend $10,000 on a wig that everybody oh cringes over. Uh, oh, wow. Well, with, with, with all, all of that, and again, the casting went really well in the end, uh, just as a theoretical uh, what if, if you, knowing what you do now, knowing about the reception, knowing, um, you know, uh, being 20, nearly 30 years removed from it, is there anything that you would do different about that TV movie? More well, screen time for the mold guy. I, I would have... I would have I would have not set the entire thing on earth. I would mm. have taken um, I, I would have taken um, uh, taken the two of them um, on, on an adventure to another planet. Mm. Um, it would have started out on earth, but they would have escaped that moment in time and they would have gone to another pro- a planet and, and had an adventure and p- perhaps mm. even gone back to Gallifrey. Um, mm. you know I, I, I should have done a better job at using the TARDIS to, for time travel and to see some other worlds. Um, but um, I, I was so pressured into, uh, and look, you know, it sounds like an excuse and, and maybe it is, but at the time um, it felt like a lot of pressure to, to keep yeah. it contained. Uh, um, yeah. But if I could do it all over again, that, that's what I would do. I, I would have Please. split the show, the story up into thirds. It have been kind of like the, all right, uh, maybe a bit more than the Superman scene where he's flying with Lois and it sort of divorces right. the story a bit, but yeah. you get the sense of what the Doctor is and what he's capable that, of. That, that, that's right. And also give it, give it you know, a chance to, to, sh- to show her his world, who he really was. Yeah. Um, because once, one, once she bought into the fact that he was different uh, and something was going on, um, it, it, I think it, it was time to to, to really um, invest in that relationship, and I think had we have been able to do that, I think their bond would have been a lot stronger, yeah. and that would have really galvanized it. Would have um, uh, made a good statement about how the Doctor cares about humans when there's so much that's else right. as well. Yeah, yeah, and and the world around him, you know, and everything he touches and feels. I mean, to him, it was all about. Uh, making things right and exploring and, and mm. seeing new things through, you know, different eyes. You know, I have a good friend, uh, Dr. Robert Ballard, who found the Titanic in 1985. And if you've ever got a chance to, to see an interview with him, uh, he, he's, very, he's the closest I think you'll ever come to Dr. Who as a real person. <laughs> and that, that passion to explore another world and, and, mm. and, and the, the vibrancy and the excitement about talking about these things. And, you know, w- whether he was not just a Time Lord, but whether it was like archaeology or history mm. or, or science, that, that 
passion, that exuberance for living and exploring um, is, is, is something that I, I just really embrace. I used to think as a kid, the real world doctor would be Steve Irwin. Yeah. <laughs> There's a, yeah, there's that exact well, kind well, of, there's a lot of There is a lot of yeah. There's a lot of truth to that, isn't there? I mean, he is um, he's definitely one of those characters that uh, that, that defied uh, you know normal you logic. Know is is passing the ability to understand, and that's some of that's priceless for the Doctor, I think. Oh yeah, absolutely. Well, and to, and there's to, a lot of and to get, get us, it. yeah, and, and to get us excited and passionate about uh about wanting to go yeah. on an adventure with him you know that was to yeah. me that that was all about what tom baker was you know it was like he he didn't push you away i mean john perch we played it very kind of close to the vest and you didn't really you know he, i didn't feel mm -hmm. like I, he and i were buddies whereas mm -hmm. with tom it was like oh you know i mean it, i felt very different about that character i felt more welcomed as an audience there's a lot of things you could balance about the Doctor. Um, yeah. Alienness and humanness and harshness and funness and all. Mm. Mm. Yeah, if you ask me, Tom, just lightning in a bottle, that guy. Absolutely. Was, uh, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, now I'm just, uh, the, in, the timer on Zoom is running out, so I think this is a great time to uh, cut, uh, cut there because um, I'm also out of questions. <laughs> I think you've answered them all wonderfully, <laughs> no I think. I think this has been a great experience for me. I think I, I think we've learned an awful mm. lot, haven't we, Asa? Great insight, yeah, and yeah, an honor, an honor to Abs meet you, man. Absolutely. Well, it's my pleasure, guys. Thank you for for keeping the flame alive. It's uh, <laughs> you know, it's it's a real pleasure. I, I I very much enjoyed it. Oh, thank you so much. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go listen to that theme song again. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs>